Merry Christmas. Come on, we got to come in this Saturday. Who's done with their shopping? Woo! Yeah, I'm done. I'm all done. Who's, who's not even started their shopping yet? There it is right there. Aaron, Aaron, sorry, son, I ain't. You've got no gifts coming to you this, uh, this year. Hey, let me just make mention of a couple things. One, get your photo taken today. We've got a photo booth back here at the back, so be sure. Go get your photo taken at the conclusion of service. Get your boo, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your kids, whoever. Just grab anybody. It doesn't matter. Just grab somebody. Go take a picture with them back there. Hey, also, it's a holiday weekend, but there, uh, there's... If you thought COVID was over, it's not. <laughs> we got a lot of people in our church dealing with COVID right now, so which is why we have a large population gone today. So just want to remember all the people dealing with that in our church and, of, of course, across the city. But keep them in your prayer. Can you do that? Yes. All right. Turn to your uh, – if you got a Bible, open to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Now, here's the thing. Today, I'm going to be reading a significant amount of Scripture today. And maybe you have a New Year's resolution to read more passages of Scripture. Well, today, you're in luck because we're going to read a ton of Scripture. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 to 20. And we're also going to be looking at verses 26 through 38. And if you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen for you. You can follow along. I'm going to be reading today from actually the New Living Translation, which is not a translation I typically read from, but that's the one I'm going to be following today. Luke chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse number 11. It says this. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel reassured him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice up at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Another translation says, while he's in his mother's womb. He'll be, look at that, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit while he's in his mother's womb. Interesting. While he's in his mother's womb. Ooh, hmm. Maybe God's showing us where life begins. That's another message. It's not another topic. I'm not going to go there today, but maybe God is showing us here something. And we'll turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he will cause those who were rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Now, verse 18 jacked me up. Zechariah said to the angel, how? How can I be sure of this? Looking at an angel, looking at Gabriel, looking at this guy standing in the where no one should be. He says, how? <laughs> How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is well along in years. Translated, she old. <laughs> I'm old. We're beyond the baby-bearing years. He looks at the angel. He says, what sign? What sign are you going to give me, angel? <laughs> looking at an angel that the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. Translated, I didn't make this up, Zechariah. I'm just bringing you the word from the Lord. I didn't come up with this. Verse 20. But now, since you did not believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Now let's skip on down to verse number 26. I'm going to skip on down to verse 26. It says this. In the sixth month, so now Elizabeth is pregnant. Now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent who? Another angel by the name of the same angel, the same Gabriel that appeared to Zechariah in the temple. The same angel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared and said to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed. And Mary tried to think of what the angel could possibly mean. And, she, and the angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be very great, for real, for real great, and he 
will, he will have the have lost my place. And will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and his kingdom will and I'm sorry, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel but how? How can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth will become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the word of, the God, of God will never fail. Not one promise from God is empty of power. Can I get an amen? The word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Verse 20 got me again. Go back to verse 20. Zechariah said, but now since you did not believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. The angel shut him up. He got a case of the shut ups from the angel Gabriel. I want to talk to you today from this simple thought. See the wonder. Come on, say, see the wonder. See the wonder. I almost entitled this message, Shut Up and Open Your Eyes. But I thought that was probably a little too harsh for a Christmas sermon. So I, I decided to go with see the wonder. We can also say the wonder of Christmas better your life would be if you would just close your mouth and open your eyes. You know how much, life, how much better life would be? Now here's the thing. I love going to married folk, especially married folk who are like they're done, like done having kids, right? Like they're they're beyond the years. I love going to those couples and being like, hey, so when are you going to have another kid? Right? And, they, and then they're always like, no, 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 we're done. And then they always make like obscene gestures like Snip, snip, snip. With our factory is shut. Right? The whole thing. And I'm like, clearly, you've never read Luke 137. For nothing is implied. If God wants you to have another kid, you're going to have another kid. Zechariah and Elizabeth, well beyond their childbearing years. For nothing is impossible with God. Now, let's not miss the Christmas story here. The first announcement, it didn't start with an angel to a with an angel to a virgin Mary. It started with an angel to a guy who's retired, to a guy who's a senior citizen. The angel appears to an old guy. It, like they've got their AARP card. They are beyond childbearing years. They are written, like they're done having kids. The Christmas story starts with an announcement to a senior citizen. And the angel, in accomplishing God's plan, messes up Zechariah and Elizabeth's plan. And so messing up their plan, he accomplishes God's plan. Now today, we're going to talk about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now I know every preacher is probably talking about Mary and talking about Joseph and talking about the baby Jesus and the nativity and how cute baby Jesus is. They're all talking about Mary and Joseph. But today, I want us to understand that the story of grace did not start at the nativity scene. To be sure, it's the culmination of the story of grace. But it, did, it started well before the story of the, uh, of the nativity scene. Like, to be sure, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they ate of the forbidden fruit, like, scratch that. Now, well before the foundations of the earth, the story of grace actually began. Like, before they had a chance to mess it up, God had a plan before Satan had a scheme. God had a plan in our life to redeem us before Satan had a scheme. And from the beginning... God designed this to be where he would send Jesus, his son, through 77 generations, through 4,000 years. He had it all set up to redeem mankind, to redeem you, to redeem me. That's why we read a couple weeks ago. Remember Matthew chapter 1, like baby daddy, after baby daddy, after baby daddy, after name you can't pronounce, after name that sounds like a disease. Remember we read that a couple weeks ago? This is the divine hand of the God who's working through the lineage of Jesus through messed up people like you and like me. This is the divine hand of God working through the generations to accomplish accomplish his purpose, to accomplish his promise, and to accomplish his plan. This is how God works. And I want to talk today about Zechariah and Elizabeth because they were, they were faithful. 
They were commit. They're just serving in the church one day. They are constant. They are consistent. And then, like, here's the thing. I love new couples. We got some. We got. We got a new couple in the room over here. I love new couples because they're all huggy dug, like huggy lovey, right? Like kissy kissy, hands all over. Like I love. Yep, there it is, right there. Careful, careful. Like there it is, right there. But like, but listen. Give me the old couple, right? Give me that old couple, like walking into the restaurant. Like takes 35 minutes to get to their seat, and they sit and they look like they're scowling at each other. And they don't say anything to each other. Give me that couple. They got nothing to say to each other. Why? Because they done said it all already. They got nothing else to say, but they are consistent. They are faithful. They are true to each other. Like, don't give me, like, I love walking into the gym, but I hate the guys over in the corner, like, ah, trying to bench press like 300 pounds. I'm like, bro, that's not impressive to me. Give me the 80-year-old over in the corner. You know the guy I'm talking about, right? The, the, the Adidas Daisy Dukes, right? The, 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 the patch all worn out. He's got the five pounders. He's like, eating. He's not just going at it. Give me, give me that guy. Give me consistent. This is Zechariah. This is Elizabeth too. They're faithful. They're consistent. They are true. This was what was shocking to me that the moment, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, the moment that Zechariah opened his mouth and spoke to Zechariah, that shattered 400 years of silence from God. Not one prophet opened their mouth. And for, remember, in the, like when you go to your new, when you go to your Bible and you open your Bible and you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you just flip a page. We just we, now we're here, now we're there. That's good, but that represents four hundred years of silence. From not one prophet opened their mouth. Not one word from God. The people wondering, God, you made a promise that Messiah was coming. You made this promise to us, but four hundred years of silence. 400 years of nothing has God made you a promise and you feel like he's silent. God is still working. God is still moving through the generations. God is still working through your story to accomplish his plan. 400 years of silence in the moment Gabriel goes to Zechariah and says, you have found favor with God. That shatters 400 years of prophetic silence. Now catch this. Catch this. Don't miss this today. I want to talk Zechariah and Elizabeth. Their names are important. Zechariah means God remembers. Do you know what Elizabeth means? His oath. Zechariah, God remembers. Elizabeth, his oath. God remembers his oath. The prophetic silence shattered the moment he goes. He goes to a couple named God remembers his oath. Every time they walk in the room and they say, hi, I'm Zechariah, I'm Elizabeth, they are declaring God remembers his oath. Every time they post a picture on Instagram, they are declaring God remembers his oath. Every time they go anywhere, they are declaring God remembers his oath. They were faithful. They were from a lineage that was faithful, blameless, true, consistent. Oh, what else does the Bible say? Oh, yeah, they were old. <laughs> they were they were like, they're in retirement age. They are senior citizens by our day and age. And here's what I say. Here's why I mentioned their age. And here's why I believe that the Bible mentions their age. I find age to be incredibly um, interesting in our day. And I find it to be incredibly dividing. You ever find that? Age is an incredibly dividing thing in our day and age. But what, what we see all represented through culture and through the Bible is that when God does a work, he does it through the generations. Like, like we've had people come to our church. Let me just give you an example. You come to church, you see people, you're like, oh, this is an awesome church, this is good. I get the behind the scenes, right? Like I get the I get the emails, I get the calls, I get the cook, the coffee, right? Like, and we've had people come to our church. Who are who are more mature? That they're they're a little bit older, right? And they walk into our church and they say, "Wow, this is an incredibly young church. Like, I don't know if this is the church for me." And I say, "No, no, no. We need you. We need your wisdom. We need your uh, guidance. We need you in the church." But we've also had young people walk into our church, and I remember this conversation so clearly. It was a day that we had a significant more amount of more mature people in our in our crowd that particular day and they walked in and said this is a cool church but it's really an old church and I'm like no 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 we need you in this church like we need when God does a work he does it through the generations God is so concerned with generations connecting that before he visits a 14 year old virgin he first goes to the senior citizen when God does a work he's going to do it through the generations before he goes to the virgin Mary he first goes to the senior citizen Zechariah and Elizabeth. This is because no one else can understand the supernatural idea of God coming upon them and opening up the womb and giving. No one else can understand other than Mary, a 14-year-old, and Elizabeth, a senior citizen. No one else can understand this. No, Mary had no one else to call other than Elizabeth. Generations coming together. Older generations. We need you in a church. We need your wisdom. We need
need your grace. We need your guidance. Younger people in the room, we need you. We need, we need, to, we need to know when our hairstyles out of, out of whack. We need to know like what people, we need to know. We need the generations coming together. This is why the Bible says, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will pour all men, young women, all together. Men, women, girl, boy, and we need the we need the generations coming together. This is like there's this story in uh, I think it's Second Kings. I've never preached it, and I've never I've not, I should preach it one day. There's a story I forget the chapter Second Kings. The prophet Elisha. He is old, and the Bible says he's bald. <laughs> and, you, and there was a, a group of young men making fun of the prophet Elijah. Like, eh, he's old, eh, he's bald, right? They're making fun of You know what Elisha does? He calls out a bear, a, a bear from the woods to maul these young people. To maul, like, he's like, ah, who's laughing now? Like, who's bald now? We need the generations coming together. God isn't concerned with your age. He's concerned with your wonder. He's concerned with your sense of awe. How do you know you're getting old? It's not when your hair starts falling out. It's not when your teeth start falling out, talking like, hey, 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 talking like this. It's not, it's not that. It's when you've lost your wonder. It's when you've lost, your, you know you've aged. When you've lost your wonder and your awe at the supreme miracle working power of God, even at the simple things like I woke up this morning. There's breath in my lungs. God is doing a new thing in my life. You, in my life, you know you've lost your all and you've lost your wonder. You're like, give a scripture for that. I'm happy to give you scripture for that. Remember when the remember when she, in the gospels Jesus is preaching and the little kids are all coming to Jesus. What do the disciples do? They go, shoot, get away. Shh. In church, listen. Shh. It's not a biblical concept. If you ever go to a kid and you say, shh, in church, I'm going to throw a Bible at your head and say, read it. Because Jesus said, let the little kids come unto me. You must become like a little child if you're going to enter the kingdom of God. But, but, but you say, wait a minute. But Paul says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought I was like a child. Like, but Jesus says, you must become like a child. Paul says, you must put away childish things. So which is it? Listen, there's a difference between being childlike and childish. There's a difference between being childlike and childish. Childish is immaturity. Childish is people who've been in church for 20 years, 30 years, and all of a sudden they start hopping around church to church to church talking about, well, I'm not getting fed. <laughs> Feed yourself. You've been in church for 30 years. Go get involved. Go pick up a chair. Go serve. This is childish. Childlike is wonder. Childlike is awe. Childlike is anything is possible with my God. I don't I like I love the age of my kids right now because I can make up any story and they're like, Daddy, no way. And you're like, absolutely. I made up a story the other day of a bearilla. You know what a bearilla is? A bear and a gorilla together. And I talked about how they feel, how they had rescued the princess. And they're like, Daddy, no, it's not true. And I convinced them through my story. It is true. And they're like, Daddy, this is a mess. I don't want them to lose their awe. I don't want them to lose their wonder. Listen, today, have you lost your wonder? Have you lost your awe at the supreme miracle-working power of the God who is constantly working? It is so easy to do in our cynical age, is it not? Like, we can't even say, did you know? Because we're like, T -t 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 I'm Google. Yeah, actually, I did know. <laughs> right? Like, we can't sit in the mystery. Uh, we can't sit in the tension of mystery anymore. And sometimes because our mouths are open, our eyes are shut to the things that God's doing. Sometimes we got to close our mouth. we got to open our eyes. Can I ask you today, how old are you? I'm not interested in your age. I'm asking, have you lost your wonder? Have you lost that ability to just sit back and say, wow, God, so amazing. Have you lost the ability to say it backwards? Wow. And maybe you don't laugh at that because you've lost your wonder. <laughs> you've lost your awe. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I don't think there's anything worse than being old and cynical or being young. And cynical. Can I give you some blues clues? You know what blues clues are? Blue, let's give, me, give me some of these right here. Like if you've lost your wonder, you've lost your gratefulness. You've lost your thankfulness. Like you've lost the ability to be grateful for the simple things in life. Like I'm so huh? I'm so grateful for this cup of coffee. I'm so grateful. Like some of you, like you go to work and people are like, oh, I love Sue. Sue's awesome. Sue brings cookies. Sue's so bubbly. Sue's so awesome. But at home, Sue is like, cut the lights off. <laughs> right? Stay on your side of the bed. Like there's a totally different person altogether. You've lost 
lost your ability to have the wonder of life. Keep your wonder. Keep your awe. Back in our, two, in our text in Luke, let me go back there, Zechariah, he thinks that his problem is that his age, his chronological, he thinks his problem is his age, right? Like, Gabriel, look at up. I'm old. My wife, she's old. Like, we're done. We're done having, I don't want to go find a babysitter. I don't want to have to, God, that, that, not my life anymore. But he thinks his problem is his age. It's not his, it's not his problem at all. His problem is that he has lost his wonder. He's still saved. He's still faithful. He's still serving in the church, but he's lost his wonder. And, I, and if I'm being honest with you, I don't think that I blame Zachariah. I don't think I blame him. Because here's what happens in your life and my life. Disappointment sets in. And then year after year, we're praying, God, give me, like, for, look, look. so here's the background. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they prayed for a kid. God, give us a kid, year after year. In that culture, year after year, the one thing that was held in high esteem was having a child. It was having a kid to pass on your family name, to pass on your lineage. That was held in high esteem. Year after year, Zechariah and Elizabeth, God, would you bless us with the child? God, year after year, there's no avail. Year after year, their prayers go unanswered. And then what happens? Disappointment comes and disappointment sets in. Year after year, you may be praying for deliverance for something in your life and year after year you still find yourself dealing with the same thing year after year you're praying for healing in your life you're praying over your marriage you're praying for the salvation of your spouse you're praying over something in your life but year after year nothing is happening and what happens is year after year disappointment sets in the disappointment sets in and it begins to rob us of our wonder what have you stopped praying for today what have you stopped believing God for today what have you been so disappointed by that you stopped reminding God of it Who's the person in your life that you've stopped witnessing to because they haven't prayed the prayer of salvation yet? What have you? What do you? What have you stopped believing God for in your life? Keep your wonder. Keep your awe. Okay, here's what I love. I'm going to wrap it up here. Here's what I love about this story. The miracle we read. When Gabriel goes to Zechariah, the miracle we read started well before Gabriel ever showed up on the scene. We know this from, from, from the Bible that Zechariah was a priest. And uh, scholars estimate that in that time, in this story, there were some 20,000 priests represented in the land of Israel. And every single year, one of the priests' job was to go into the temple of the Lord and offer sacri or offer uh, offer the incense to the Lord. Now, here's how they chose. What you got to understand is they chose by lot. They chose Vegas style. They rolled the dice. If the dice falls to you, you get to go into the temple of the Lord. There were some priests who go their whole life without ever getting a chance to offer sacrifices to the Lord, offer the incense to the Lord. So year after year, Zechariah goes to the temple, they cast the lots. Sorry, Zechariah, it's not your year. He goes back home. Next year, he comes back, roll the dice, cast the lots, not his year. He goes back home. Next year, he goes back, they cast the lots, they roll the dice, it's not his year. Year after year after year after year, and finally, Zechariah is now an old man. Talk about like he's going to go to the temple, right? He's like, I don't even know why I go to the temple. I might as well stay home, watch the bears. They're going to lose and disappoint me anyway. Like, why am I going to go to the temple? This particular year, they roll the dice and they say, Zechariah, he's an old man. Zechariah, it's your year. Zechariah, he's like, huh? He can't hear. He's old. He's, he's confused. He's like, what? Is my year? He goes into the temple of the Lord. And here's what happens. You walk into the most holy of holies and you have in there the lampstands. And you have the table of the Lord with the showbread. And on that table of the Lord, the priest would offer the myrrh, and it would offer the frankincense. They'd burn it in the presence of the Lord, and they'd wait for the smoke to rise. Because here's what would happen outside of the temple. All the people were waiting for the smoke to rise up. Because that smoke rising up out of the temple represented the prayers of the people going to the ears of the Lord. Now people talk about the temple like it's this massive, amazing structure. They said you could see it from 30 miles away. Imagine being out in Bolingbrook, Illinois. And you're driving into the city. And over the horizon you can see the skyscrapers of Chicago. That's what it was like. You could see this massive structure. You could see the smoke being risen that particular time of the year people would wait for that and then they'd wait for the they'd wait for the priest to come out and then pronounce the blessing come on you've heard it the lord bless you and keep you it's numbers chapter six the blessing that's what that's what the priest would do the people are all waiting for it. zachariah then turns around and boom there's gabriel boom there's i'm gonna 
talking about like chest out, like this whole, like we got to change this mentality, like baby angels floating around with the diaper and the halo. That's not it at all. Because every time I see an angel in the Bible, the angel's talking about like, hey, don't die. <laughs> Come on, get up. Don't be afraid. Like this is what the angels are talking about here. Don't be afraid. Zechariah says, fear not. I've got great news for you. Your prayers have been answered. You're going to have a baby. You're going to call him John. He will have favor with God. And he will have power like that of Elijah. Now, here's what I love. Zechariah, looking at Gabriel, sees all of this stuff happening. The fearful, wonderful creature of Gabriel. Zechariah is looking at him, and he says, How? What sign, Gabriel, <laughs> are you going to give? He's looking at an angel. He's looking at Gabriel, and he says, How? What son of a, like, listen, we, we, we judge this guy. We laugh at this guy. But if a person can look at an angel after praying for the thing that they finally been praying, they finally get the word of the God, word of God. How much more do you and I deal with? We doubt God and we don't even have the benefit of seeing this angel. You know, it's possible to reject the word of the Lord because it's taken so long for you to receive it. It's possible for you to reject your healing because it's taken so long for you to receive that healing. It's possible for you to reject God because you don't understand it in the natural. It's possible for this to happen in our life. I mean, the Pharisees did it all the time, right? Like they're walking around. Remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000? They're walking around, right? Jesus multiplies the bread. He multiplies the fish. I bet there were Pharisees in that crowd, probably eating of the bread, eating of the fish, talking about, mm, this fish is good. Mm, this bread is so moist. This bread is amazing. Like, where did they get this bread and this fish from? Talking about Jesus. This fish is awesome. But give us a sign. Give us a sign that you're still the Messiah. Give us a sign that you're actually the Savior of the world. They did it all the time. It's possible for you to miss the wonder when it's right in front of your face. Can I tell you my issue with this text? I, I want to tell you my issue because I think it's, I don't, I, like, I don't know how you read the story. I'm going to tell you how I read the story. And I'll tell you how I went back into it. And here's my issue with it. Specifically, I got an issue with Gabriel. Okay, here's my issue with Gabriel. Zechariah is doing his thing. He's faithful. He's in the temple. The whole thing. He goes to Zechariah. Zechariah, you found favor with God. You are you going to have a son. Like, finally, your prayers have been answered. Gabriel says that to him. And then Zechariah says, how? What sign can I have for confirmation? And then what happens? Gabriel says, Booyaka, you can no longer speak for nine months. You're silent. You're shut up now for nine months. Fast forward six months, same story, different town. Gabriel goes to the Virgin Mary and says, Mary, you have found favor with God. You're going to have a son. He's going to be great, but he's going to be for real great. This is going to be the savior of the world. His kingdom will never end. Mary says, and Gabriel says, girl, you fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> like the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. Zechariah says, how? What sign are you going to give me to prove that this is actually confirmation from God? Mary says, how? And the Holy Spirit, and Gabriel says, it's all good. I'm going to take care of it for you. The Holy Spirit is going to take care of it all for you, girl. Sit back, relax. It's going to be all good for you. This, this is my issue. Like, this is gender discrimination, is it not? If he's got to be quiet, she's got to be quiet. If she's quiet, he's going like, this, this is crazy to me. But then I went back to the text. And I recognize that's not what happened at all. That's not what Zechariah, and that's not what Mary said at all. I went back, and what Zechariah was saying was, Gabriel, prove it to me. In other words, I'll believe it when I see it. Gabriel, I don't believe the word. I'll believe this when you give me confirmation of it. What Mary was saying is, I believe it. I just don't see it yet. I believe it. Hold, I believe the Holy Spirit will come upon me, but I am a virgin. I've never been with a man. I believe that this is possible, God, but I don't see it yet. Zechariah says, give me a sign for the confirmation to believe. Mary says, no, I believe it. I'm just waiting to see it. There's a difference between a person who speaks doubt of their heart and needs proof of the miracle and the person who says, no, no, no. I believe I have the job. I just don't see it yet. I believe I have my healing. I just don't see it yet. I believe I'm going to have a family. I just don't see it yet. I believe the great church is going to have its own building one day to have greater impact in the city. I just don't see it yet. I'll believe it when I see it. Mary says, no, 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 I believe it. 
I just don't see it. Man. Don't get them twisted. They said two completely different things. And then Mary said, let it be to me as you have spoken. And her mouth was open and started praising God. But because Zechariah's eyes were closed, Gabriel said, so too shall your mouth be shut. Now sit back and watch. <laughs> sit back and watch what I will do. See the wonder. See the wonder. Let me give you just a little bit more, and I promise I'm going to wrap it up. We're going to sing a few more carols. We're going to partake of communion, but let me give you just a little bit more here. Gabriel visits. This is, this is okay, this is, this is another, like, my mind just kind of going places here. I'll just kind of clue you in here. Like, Gabriel goes to Mary, <laughs> and, she, and, like, that's convenient, right? Because, like, Mary, her, she's the one carrying the child. So this is convenient to me that Gabriel goes to Mary says, Mary, you're going you're gonna to become pregnant, but not in a natural way. In a supernatural way, you're going to become pregnant. That's convenient, right? Because, like, sure, her body's going to be changing. But, Zach, but Gabriel goes to Zechariah. He doesn't even go to Elizabeth. He doesn't go to the person who's going to be pregnant. He's not, he, didn't, he goes to Zechariah, and he goes to him. Like, somebody should clue Elizabeth in that she's going to be pregnant here, right? Like, somebody should clue her in. And because Zechariah doubts... Gabriel silences his mouth. But here's the thing. The miracle in Elizabeth was that God opened her womb. But the pregnancy was still going to be natural. It was still going to be done in the way that it has to be done for someone to become pregnant. But here's the thing. Zechariah, he can't talk. <laughs> so Gabriel says, wink, wink, go on home. Gabriel, go on home, Zechariah. Hang out with your wife. But he can't speak. Like, she, he probably gets home. Like, just think about it. Just think about it naturally for a moment. He probably gets home. Like, Elizabeth's talking. She probably chatting. She probably talking about the day. Talking about what happened in the temple. Zachariah's sitting there, like, just, just nodding the whole time. Elizabeth's probably like, mm, boy, you're such a good listener, right? Like, what's going on here tonight? And Zachariah's just nodding the whole time. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. He starts lighting the candles. And what happens? They become pregnant. Listen, if there is no intimacy, there is no miracle. If there is no intimacy, there is no miracle in this particular story. If you wait around, if, if he waits around for God to do it like he was going to do it in Mary, the miracle is not going to happen. There are some things that God will open in your life, but you still have to do your part. There are some things in your life where the miracle has already happened, but you still got to do your part. God has already provided you for the job, but you still got to apply and you still got to go to the interview. God has already provided for you a family, but you got to be with your spouse. God has already provided you financial freedom, but you still got to do your part. There are some things God's already done in your life. Some of you just sit back saying like, well, I, well, God said it. God said he was going to do it. And he's like, yeah, God did say he was going to do it. But now you got to do your part. God did his part for Zechariah and for Elizabeth. He opened Elizabeth's womb. But now Zechariah's got to do his part as well. Mary's pregnant. Very scared. And God so sets it up that Mary and Elizabeth have each other. I mean, who else would understand the ramifications of a supernatural pregnancy like this other than Mary and Elizabeth? Everyone's like, I want God's blessing. I want God's favor in my life. Really? Do you really want God? Do you know that Mary carried that stigma around for years? People walking around talking about, oh, that's Mary. She's talking about that's God inside of me. <laughs> like God did this. Can you imagine the stigma that this young 14-year-old virgin who told the story of the Holy Spirit overshadowing her? Can you, under, can you imagine the stigma? Can you imagine when Mary, she goes and visits Elizabeth and Zechariah, and she's talking about it. And she's talking about the, the Holy Spirit did this to me. And Zechariah, he can't talk. He's probably eyes rolling, right? Like a whole thing. Like, this is crazy. Listen, be careful who you surround yourself with. Some of you surround yourself with people who the moment you speak of the dreams in your heart, they give you charts and they give you reasons why it can't happen, why it shouldn't happen, and why it couldn't happen. Listen, I don't want people to look at my current reality and say that that's going to be your future destiny. I don't want people to see my current reality and speak and say, I, I see how God can work. I see how God can move. I see how God can do this in your life. Let's go back to the text here. Luke, uh, verse number 50, 59 says this. When the baby was eight days old, they all came from this, uh, for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Verse 61, they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. 
In priestly tradition, a person who was a priest would often name their firstborn son after them. It was kind of a way to keep the name in the family. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives with that name. Then they made signs to his father, Zechariah, to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote his name is John. And immediately, his mouth was opened. And his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, praising God. What is the proper response when you receive a word and a promise from God? Praise. What is the proper response when God makes you a promise? You praise. What is the proper response when you are waiting for that promise to be fulfilled? You praise God. And if you can't praise God, then you keep your mouth shut, and you keep your eyes open, and you just watch. And you just watch what God will do. And if you can't keep your mouth shut, then he'll shut your mouth for you. But surround yourself with people who will see the miracle before it actually happens. See the miracle. See the wonder. See the wonder of the story of Christmas. God's promises to you and to me, they are yes. They are amen. We say it all the time in the story of Christmas. Because Jesus is the promise. He was the fulfillment of the promise. The person we've been waiting for for 4,000 years. He's the fulfillment of the promise. What God has promised will come true. What God has promised you will come true. Praise God. And if you can't praise God, keep your mouth shut and keep your eyes open and see the wonder of the story of Christmas. Amen.